the second event of the Young Scientist Roundtable for this school year. Today, we are going to be focusing more on Alpha Centauri and uh, laser beam. The next speaker is going to be, I, th I believe, November 9, November 12, Tuesday. That is Kent Ustra. He's coming from the Washington, state of Washington, and he'll be talking on the subject of DNA sequencing for food safety. So let's talk about today. This evening, our speaker is Dr. James Leger. He received B.S. in Applied Physics from the California Institute of Technology in 1974, and in 1980, he received Ph.D. degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of California at San Diego. He is currently Professor of Electrical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Before that, he has also worked at 3M as well as MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Professor Leger has received numerous awards, some of them more than once. So to make it short, just let me tell you what he received in year 2006, just one year. ETA Kappa New Outstanding Teaching Professor Award, ITSB Professor of the Year Award, Morse Award for Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching, George Taylor Distinguished Teaching Award, George Taylor Service Award, and also, he was inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Teachers at the University of Minnesota. That's the caliber of speaker we have for this evening. Dr. Leger is a fellow of the Optical Society of America, fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and fellow of the International Society of Optical Engineers. His research group studying a wide variety of optical techniques, including laser, laser mode control and beam shaping techniques. Also, when he was doing his PhD, he was involved in holography and hologram. That's the aspect he's going to be talking about in round table part two. So part two, he's going to be devoting to hologram, but for the part one, he's going to be talking on riding a laser beam to Alpha Centauri, Dr. Leger. Well, thank you, Vinod. Um, do we need a sound check on this? Is this working okay? Can you hear it? Is that better? Okay. Well, you've put a lot of pressure on me, Vinod, um, so I'm not sure I can live up to this, but I'll, I'll do my very best. It's really nice to see a great audience like this. This is far better turnout than my lectures, so I really appreciate that, that, uh, that everyone came out today. Um, I'd like to do sort of a combination lecture here. I have some slides. You'll have to have slides if you uh, give a lecture nowadays. And so I have a, a few things to explain, some topics. But then I also have a, a large set of uh, demonstrations that I'd like to show you. So um, with that, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm titling this lecture, uh, Riding a Laser Beam to Alpha Centauri. And it's a topic that has been around for quite some time, but in the last few years, it's gained some momentum and several groups around the world have been given some money to explore this topic. I want to tell you at the outset, it's not gonna take people and it is extremely difficult, so it may not happen for many, many, many years, if at all. So you may wanna leave at this point because it's, <laughs> I don't want you to be disappointed. On the other hand, the physics of how we might actually send a spacecraft to another star is exciting, amazing, and in fact, it may be possible. So with that, let me go ahead and get started. Well, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an outline. I'd like to uh, say a little bit about, not so much me, but where I come from, the department uh, at the University of Minnesota. But then the rest of it is really going to be talking about um, reaching for the stars, how we could get to Alpha Centauri. And uh, I talk about uh, making a photon drive for a starship. It sounds like it's right out of uh, Star Trek. It's actually just a monster laser, and I'll show you how that's done. And because I know this is a, an audience of a lot of younger 
young scientists. I want to try to tell you a little bit about how we make light, how um, laser light is special. And so I have several experiments that we'll be doing um, to uh, explore that. I'll touch a little bit on the work that I'm doing in this project, how to make very large lasers. And then uh, at the very end, depends how much time we have left, I have um, some other slides that we could explore other parts of optics. I have a feeling we probably won't get there, but just in case, um, there are so many interesting things you can do in this field. Um, I'd, I'd love to tell you about some more of them. Okay, so as I said, I want to tell you a little bit about the department that I come from. I come from the electrical and computer engineering department, um, and it's a very broad department. My, my own training is in applied physics, so I don't really consider myself an electrical engineer, but uh, others in the department very much are. I just want to go through the spectrum of things that we do in this department. And I'm especially hoping that some of the younger students that are looking for careers might consider this really exciting field. For example, efficient energy, energy production is a very large uh, and important topic now, especially with, especially with global warming. Biomedical instrumentation and devices is something that electrical engineers do uh, a lot of. I'm showing a, a magnetic resonance imaging machine. Robotics is a, an intersection between computer science, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. This is telesurgery, where the surgeon can be on the other side of the planet and the robot's doing the surgery. Um, Internet of Things is exemplified by something like a self-driving car, computers, ICs, networks, the, the design of the computer chips. Those are all done by electrical and computer engineers. Cell phones, the design of, uh, of the, the iPhone 11, um, the um, 5G processing and so on is all done by our types of engineers. And finally, this last one is, is my area. This is uh, laser design, magnetic storage, acoustics, things that are generally found in the physics department uh, have gravitated to electrical engineering. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna tell you about me and where I come from, and now let's see if we can take a trip to the stars. So I first want to point out where Alpha Centauri is, because how many of you have heard of Alpha Centauri? Is that something? Okay, so you guys are really with it. All right. So this is how far away it is, 25 trillion miles, or we probably should stay in metric, 40 trillion kilometers. That's a lot. It's so much that, you know, you can't even get a feel for how much it is. Well, maybe one way, well, I have a picture here. Here's the sun. Here's what's called the Oort cloud. This is in light years, so it's a little over four light years away. It's the closest star. We want to go to the closest one, of course, because that's the easiest thing. Um, right, so uh, where is the Earth in this picture? Well, it's, it's not even a pixel away from the center of that sun. As a matter of fact, it's, Alpha Centauri is, the, an astronomical unit is uh, the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. It's 300,000 times farther away than our Sun is. Okay, even that's hard to imagine. I mean, 300,000 times something that you don't really even know how big it is. So, how about if I asked, have, has anybody here been to Disney World? Yeah, did anybody go by car? That's kind of a really terrible way to do it, but it takes about 24 hours to get there by car. Right, so Alpha Centauri is eight billion round trips to Disney World. And you know how long it takes to get to D Disney World. So you have to do that eight billion times. And that's a round trip to Disney World. We're only going one way to Alpha Centauri. So it's incredibly far away. Where is it in the sky? This is a picture of it here. You've probably never seen it unless you've been to the Southern Hemisphere because you really can't see it <coughs> from the Northern Hemisphere. It's close to the Southern Cross. There's a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere that's called the Southern Cross. And you would be able to see it if you uh, were in anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere like Australia, Africa, and South America. Right, so it's kind of a fair question to ask why we might want to go to Alpha Centauri. That's, um, that's a long ways away. Um, in fact, 
it, Alpha Centauri is actually a triple star system. So uh, it consists of the main brightest stars are Alpha Centauri A and B, they're here. This uh, artist's rendition is showing what would happen if we went by Proxima Centauri, which is the one that we would like to visit. Proxima Centauri is a lot dimmer, it's a red dwarf, um, but we're close to it here. And so the question is, well, why would we want to go there? Um, the standard answer to why you climb a mountain is because it's there. That's sort of the same thing here. It's just a cool thing to do. I mean, we'll go there and maybe we'll find some amazing thing that we never thought would exist. But there's another compelling reason, and that's because fairly recently, Proxima b was discovered. Proxima b is a planet that's orbiting Proxima Centauri. And not only that, but it's apparently in the habitable zone, which means that if there's water on this planet, it would probably be liquid. And if life is like it is on the Earth, then it needs water. So there's a, there's a chance that there could be life on this um, distant Earth-like planet. Third reason, of course, is um, that you can't really tell that much from our instruments from the Earth. It's a long ways away. Uh, Proxima b is very dim, extremely dim. It's not a star, it's a planet. And re you really need to get up close and personal to, to see what it's all about. Okay, so building a starship. We've done this before. We've built starships. In fact, in 1977, Voyager 1 was launched. It is a starship. It's going to leave, in fact, it has left our solar system. I looked it up right before I came here, and it looks like uh, it's 141 astronomical units from the Earth. Remember, an astronomical unit is the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun, 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers. Well, it's 141 astronomical units away. To give you a feel, uh, Pluto is between 30 and 40 astronomical units. It's an elliptical orbit, so it's between 30 and 40. Uranus is, is 30. So it's, it's quite a ways out of our solar system, and it's going to keep going to the next star. Um, it's traveling at 17 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast. So if you were to hitch a ride on Voyager and wanted to go to downtown Minneapolis, it would take, what, about a second and a half? So it's moving pretty fast. Okay. How long does it take Voyager to get to Disneyland or Disney World? What's your guess? What do you think? Somebody shout out an answer. You can just... One and a half seconds. One and a half seconds. Two... So, well, you guys are smart. Two minutes. Did you see my slides? <laughs> okay, good guess. It'll take two minutes to get to Disney World. That's pretty cool. How long do you think it'll take to get to Alpha Centauri on this really fast spaceship? Somebody else. You're too good. How about you? A few years? Yeah, that's a pretty good guess. A few is 74,000. Okay, this is just not going to do it. Um, here's an interesting question. What's life going to be like 74,000 years from now? Uh, well, hard to know. I have some guesses, but we can look 74,000 years backwards what was life like 74,000 years ago where you would have had to launch this thing? Well, I'm going to show you. It's kind of in the middle of the Paleolithic era, which Paleolithic means Stone Age, and not much was going on. So my point is, don't hitch a ride on Voyager. It's just going to take too long. Okay, so you might say, well, why don't we just build a bigger rocket? I mean, you know, that sounds like a straightforward path. This is the largest rocket that's ever been built, the Saturn V. There's another one, uh, the um, Space Launch System, I think it's called, uh, which is maybe going to be bigger, but it's not functional yet. So right now, this is a, the biggest rocket that's ever been built. This is a, a SpaceX Merlin rocket motor, which is um, uh, on like the Falcon Heavy and so on. Um, the problem is that rockets must carry their own fuel. Is this whole thing is mostly fuel. And if you want to get something going close to the speed of light, which we need the spacecraft to get close to the speed of light, or is this going to take too long? 
Remember I said it was four and a half light years away. That means if it's going the speed of light, it's still a pretty long journey. It's four and a half years. So if you do that, it turns out you can show that chemistry is just not ever going to get you there in a reasonable time. It's just not going to happen. It's great for going to the planets, but it just won't take us to the stars. So what if we use light as a propellant? So a rocket engine has a chemistry that goes on and just squirts these, mo these molecules out the rear end. What if we use light to do a similar thing? Well, that sounds kind of crazy, but in fact, light can push and trap things. And an example, this uh, was the Nobel Prize in Physics last year, well, part of it. Arthur Ashkin showed that you can focus light to a tiny spot and actually grab onto things. It's a very cool experiment done here where this is a strand of DNA and it was attached to two uh, polystyrene beads. This bead was attached to a micropipette and the other bead was, grab was adhered to a focused laser beam. The laser beam can grab things and they were using it to measure the spring constant of the DNA. So you can exert force on very small things with a laser beam. Well, if you can do that, maybe we can think about taking a, uh, a large laser. It's just like taking a garden hose and spraying it on something and pushing the whatever, the wagon or whatever that you're spraying with the garden hose along and the, the fact that the droplets of water hitting there is moving the, is moving the wagon. So here we have light coming in, blasting against this mirror. It reflects off and the net change in momentum here is right along this red line. So it's possible to do that. But the cool thing is that now we don't have to carry the fuel with us because the laser can be on Earth. This laser is going to be immense. It's going to take lots of power. It's going to be really difficult, but it doesn't have to do the flying. The thing that's doing the flying can be just one or two grams, extremely small. So that's, um, that's, the, that's the idea. I want to just take a little bit of a diversion here and tell you that trapping of light with lasers now is commonplace. It's used in biology for cell sorting and various other applications. Um, one of the most interesting ideas that I've seen in a while is the technique of making a very large telescope in space by taking a laser and taking light out of both ends. This light goes this way and hits a mirror. This light goes this way and hits the mirror. And when these two light beams collide, they make what's called an interference pattern. And you can trap little particles in that interference pattern. Interference pattern is curved, like a parabola or a sphere. So in fact, this forms a beautiful telescope mirror, and yet you don't need all this very heavy hardware to hold the mirror together. It's held together by a laser beam using this trapping method. This is also a bit of a pipe dream. Nobody's ever built it yet. It's just kind of a um, um, on paper, but uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. Okay, so this brings me to what kind of light we need to make. It's got to be big, we know that. But it also has to be a special kind of light. If you just use a light bulb, you can't get very far. And the reason is because the light bulb sends its light everywhere. You turn a light bulb on and you, it illuminates the entire room, right? What we need is light that's extremely well collimated. That means it's going in a very straight line and it stays, it doesn't spread out very much. And a laser is such light. You can see in this, this beam here that I'm shining it around the auditorium here and it stays pretty small. Well, we have to have that because this spacecraft we're going to get this going to 20% of the speed of light. That's really, really fast. If you do the math, that means we can get to Alpha Centauri in 
20 years, about 20 years, because it's, uh, it's about five light years away. So it's about 20 years, right? That's, that's I'd like to, to get there a little earlier, but I think I might be able to live that long. So that might be, that might be a pretty good time to, to think about getting there. But that means that in just the first few seconds, it's really far away. And if we're using this light to push the spacecraft, it better be really, really well collimated to get the light on the spacecraft so it's not going everywhere. So we've got to use some sort of a, a, a laser. And this brings me to the part of the um, lecture where I'm going to show you a lot of ways to make light, the last of which is a laser. So I'm um, going to need some help with this. Does anybody want to volunteer? How about you right, yeah, right there, yep. So um, first of all, tell me your name. Omira. Oh, hi, Omira. So have you used a blowtorch before? Do you, you want to try using a blowtorch? Okay. Um, let's see. We probably should put some safety goggles on you. These are actually um, laser goggles, laser glasses, but I think it's probably okay. Tell me if you can see okay with those. You're all right? You, you look really good. Okay. So first thing I want to do, by the way, do we have somebody on the light switch up there? Okay, good. So I think maybe, first of all, um, I want you to... I think I better light this for you, but why don't you hang on to it. Don't drop it. And I'm going to get this going. Okay. And if you turn the lights out, I'm going to do something that everybody's seen before, especially if you're in a blacksmith or something. I'm simply going to show that if you heat an object up, you get it hot enough, it glows red. Can you see that? No. Yeah. How about if I show it down here? Is that better? Okay, it's not very impressive. Stoves do this. Okay, Amira, let's see. Let's let's I want you to stay here for just a second. I turn this out for a second. Um not very impressive. Why? If you hold on just one second, I have one more thing for you to do. Why? Because it wasn't very hot. Well, this may be 4,000 degrees or something like that. That's modestly hot, but it's not really hot. By the way, anything that's at all, that's above absolute zero is giving off light. You guys are giving off light. We can't see it because it's infrared light, but you are giving off light. And anybody that stays for the second half, I have a special camera where we can point it at each other and you'll all look like light bulbs. You'll all be giving off light, you'll be able to see it. It's called an infrared camera. Okay, but Amira, what I'd like you to do now is to up our game a little bit. We're going to generate more heat by making an exothermic reaction. So an exothermic reaction simply means that when we're gonna actually burn some metal, we're gonna burn some magnesium and it will liberate the, uh, the energy and the bonds of the, um, the magnesium. And it, when it oxidizes, it gives off a huge amount of heat. And so that's going to get this piece of metal a lot hotter. So here's what I want you to do. This is, you're going to move over here, please. And I've done this several times before, and I've never lit anything on fire, but it is always possible. So I want you to hold this thing over this bucket of water because it's very possible that it might light something on fire. Okay, so here's, um, these are little pellets of magnesium. Uh, and as I said, what we're going to do is to there's a good one, is to heat it up with the blowtorch until it gets to a temperature that will allow it to oxidize or react with the heat of the water. So if you just hold on to that and just make sure that it's over the bucket. Yeah. I'm going to start it oxidizing. 
And you can hold it up a little higher so everybody can see it, maybe about like that. Okay, everybody can see this now? Okay, let me see if I can get it to go here. Okay, so you can see that one, right? Okay, that's probably about 10,000 degrees, and it'll probably set off the fire alarms. You want to just dump it in the water now? Okay, woo, okay. Excellent, thank you, Amira. Let me give Amira a hand here, that's great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so, so far we've just heated things up. Turns out that's not very efficient. You can, um, you can make light, that, an incandescent light that uh, we had a lot of in our homes are being replaced by other things now, but uh, a lot of smoke. Um, but that's the way, way an incandescent light works. Right, so we can actually do better than that. Um, we can heat up atoms, or, yeah, heating up atoms will allow you to um, change the... The atoms just give off a particular kind of light, particular color of light. A sodium, a sodium lamp in your street light works exactly this way. It has sodium in there and it's giving off a light that's characteristic of sodium. So um, I have a little demonstration of that. Do I have another volunteer? Oh, God, this is great. I wish my class at university did this. How about, how about you right here? Yep, yep, that's you. Um, so this is also something that if you've taken chemistry, uh, maybe in junior high school, you may have done this. Your name is? Skitch. That's a cool name. Okay, Skitch. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to take this wire and dump it in this material here. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you, you just take the wire and shake it in the water first, and then you see there's some white powder in there. Just kind of get that white powder all over this. Just put it in the water so it gets wet, and then you can stick it in here. Okay. Right, and again, if you just hold it over the water, I'm going to... Now, so what, what we're doing now is we're taking a, a particular chemical. This happens to be uh, lithium chloride, and I'm just going to heat it up. Maybe. And remember, this is a particular chemical, so it has a particular color that it likes to give off. And lithium chloride is a beautiful red color. That's just the color that lithium chloride likes to give off. Now, there's a little bit of orange in there, too. That's red and orange. Okay, you want to dump that in the um, water. And I'm going to do one more here. And that is right here. Now I'm going to just go do this. I'm going to do this one first and have you guess. Let's put this one down and take this one, put it in the water. Just going to have you guess what you what chemical you think this might be. So, okay, over the water here. Any idea? Bright yellow. Somebody say sodium? Exactly right. It's, it's table salt. So it's, it's a sodium D-line. Thank you very much, Skitch. Great. Nice job. Uh, right. So right. So I've taken sodium and I've heated it up and given off some light. Again, not very efficient, not very effective. But maybe I could, with those same sodium atoms, if I could run electricity through them, that would be a lot more, that would be a lot better way to excite these atoms and have them give off their light. So, I need another volunteer. This is, this is a scary one. I'm actually going to pick somebody in the back. Uh, I can't see in the back. <laughs> How about you in the, uh, the blue shirt back there? Yeah, blue sweater. Okay. This is my favorite experiment. What's your name? 
Lily. Oh, hi, Lily. Okay. So here's what you get to do, Lily. This is, this is kind of a, a gooey one. Are you okay kind of making a mess? I brought these just for you. Um, what Lily's going to do, she's going to take a pickle out of this pickle jar. Can you do that? Get a nice big one in here. And then she's going to take this set of nails. Oops. And she's going to, you got a big pickle in there? Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, let's move it right over here. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to take each nail and plug it in the ends, one in one end and one in the other end, about halfway in maybe. Okay. Maybe I'll put it in a little bit farther. Okay, excellent, that's good. Now I want you to take that pickle and impale it on this chopstick. Okay. Excellent, okay. And now, your job's over. You can, you can help me clean up. But, um, but I'm going to take and I have this little fancy little machine here which is going to allow me to plug this pickle into the wall. Oh, let's see. Well, there's no way we can turn out the light, is there, huh? Maybe I could get to a dark screen. Uh, okay, this won't be as impressive as it should be, but I want everybody to look at this pick. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Now I can't see where the socket is. <laughs> Anybody see it? I've got this. Here it is. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So can we have the lights down again? All right. So keep your eye on the pickle. Uh, oh, look what it did. It's a sodium vapor lamp. Okay, lights on. Thank you, Lily. Let's give Lily a hand. This is, this is what's on your street corner. It's a bunch of sodium. You run electricity through it. The electrons bump into the sodium atoms. Sodium atoms get all excited. And then they say, oh, wait a minute. I'm not that excited anymore. And they go back to sleep. And in the process, they give off a photon, which is this special yellow color that we just saw. Okay, uh, so we're getting better. But really, um, that's not all that efficient. It's much more efficient to excite um, it's a, more efficient to excite mercury than sodium, actually. The problem with mercury is that it gives off light in the ultraviolet. But everybody's probably familiar with a fluorescent light, fluorescent lamp. They're much more efficient than, um, than uh, the sodium vapor type lamps, actually, than, than the incandescent lamp anyway. But I want to show you what happens if we excite the mercury atoms in here. They then uh, will hit the fluorescent material and give off fluorescent light, or um, visible light. But in order to excite it, I'm going to excite it with a um, roughly 15,000 volt Tesla coil here. So who wants to do this one? Uh, let's see. How about you in the black shirt there? Okay. So your name is? Mylon. Mylon? Okay, Mylon. Cool name. So Mylan is first of all going to play with this Tesla coil. Have you ever played with a Tesla coil before? Uh, no. Okay. So this puts out sparks. It makes noise. It um, does all kinds of cool things. I'm going to plug it in. If you just want to hold on to this, um, and I'll hold on to this because it could be a little bit, zzz, you know, like. So I don't want you to get electrocuted. I want you to just try um, touching it as I plug it in. Touching it to that. Um, pickle or maybe the um, maybe, maybe the nails that are around the pickle. Let's try this. So maybe we could have the lights out and you can maybe draw a nice spark with that thing. I don't know. It's a little hard to see. But 
Mylan is, um, is electrocuting a pickle, basically. <laughs> That's not very exciting. But now, try it on this. Again, can we have the lights completely out? Is that possible to just put something in front of the projector? However you did it was great. Okay, okay. now get this. Don't, don't zap me with it. <laughs> but you can zap this bulb with it. Look at that. So myelin is, is exciting the mercury atoms in this bulb simply by making a high enough potential around the bulb so that it draws the, um, it, it excites the, the mercury into this higher state, which then allows you to um, give off light. So now we're starting to get something that's actually quite efficient. All right, if we got the lights on again so that we don't zap each other. That's great. Thanks, Mylon. Appreciate that. Nice work. Okay, so I think I have one more thing to show you. Well, sort of two more things to show you. One is um, that very recently, I'm looking for, yeah, very recently, there was a Nobel Prize given to uh, some Japanese scientists for making an LED. This is an LED. Everybody has LEDs now. They're replacing all our, uh, or a lot of our um, home illumination systems. The nice thing about an LED is it's extremely efficient, much more efficient than a fluorescent light, and it can also be very, very bright. Now, the difference between an LED and a laser, and I have a laser in this hand, is not very much. The LEDs, this is a gallium nitride uh, semiconductor, so it's just a special kind of material. And it turns out if you run electricity through this, it's sort of like the pickle, except it's extremely efficient in giving off light. If you just take an LED and you make it a little bit different, put some mirrors in special places or something, um, you can make a very, very collimated beam. And if you turn the lights out now and, and completely and uh, completely block. I'm going to show you this laser beam. I hope there's nobody up there. Uh oh, okay. Uh, okay, so this is the beam that we're going to be riding to Alpha Centauri. Now, why can I see it? The only reason I can see it is because there's dust in the air. And in fact, after I uh, lit several, several of those things on fire, there's a lot of smoke in here, so it's really nice. But, um, Look at how collimated it is. So this is, you can imagine pointing this and for thousands of kilometers, it stays reasonably well collimated. So I can then just push on this, this satellite. Okay, lights back on and I think we'll probably continue with the, uh, the slideshow now. Right, so I just want to finish off with um, what this spaceship's going to look like. So this is called Project Starshot. It's, uh, it's not funded by any government because it's too outlandish for governments to fund. Actually, that's not quite true. NASA has put some money into this. Um, but for the most part, this is a privately funded thing. Uh, there are groups around the world. I happen to be working with a group from uh, the UK, United Kingdom, uh, on some of these things. and. I think I'll just start by showing you a video of an artist's conception of how this thing might actually work. Okay. Let's try something else. Okay, so here's the video. And Let's just watch it go through, and I'll, I'll explain. I will run it twice. I'll, I'll explain it first. I'll explain it after you kind of watch this video. That, by the way, is the, um, uh, the satellite. Those are the lasers. Lasers don't look like that. The artists that did this had no idea what a laser looked like. But anyway, um, okay, here the, the lasers are blasting this thing and sending it on its merry way. Turns out you only need to blast it for about 200 seconds. 
after 200 seconds, it's way too far away, so you might as well give up. You can do it every few minutes, so we can send thousands of these things to Alpha Centauri, not just one. So if we make a mistake, it's okay. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. It, it just turned sideways, by the way. You may have noticed it was traveling sideways because there's interstellar dust, and with this big sail, you don't want it to be ripped to shreds by the interstellar dust. So you have it go sideways, so it's extremely thin. It's only a few, few molecules. Oh, it just went by um, Proxima Centauri, and that is Proxima B. There it is. It's going to zip by. It looks suspiciously like Earth. Zipped by really fast, but it had time to take three pictures. And that's the mission. Now, the rest of this video, I have no idea what it's doing. It's, um, it's kind of trying to turn around, and it goes by Jupiter and Saturn and goes back. It's not going to do that. This is a one-way mission. I don't know why this video is put together the way it is. But anyway, it's basically the idea. You have a burning question, I can tell. Go ahead. Nothing has gone by Proxima B yet. Uh, in fact, uh, most likely this won't be ready to fly for, it may never be ready to fly. I told you, it's, you know, it's, it's all speculation. But uh, certainly, actually interestingly, a US senator passed a bill, or proposed a bill anyway, to have this mission funded so that it could fly by 2069 because that will be the 100th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. But my personal opinion is it won't be ready by 2069. There's so much to do um, to make this thing work. But let me just finish off by showing you what the satellite might look like. So these actually are light sails. They're, these, this is not science fiction. This, these are things that have actually been built. The one on the... Um, left is built by NASA, and the one on the right is built by the Japanese Space Agency. These actually do fly. They use the sun as power, and that's, uh, there's enough solar radiation from the, radiation from the sun that uh, you can push on these things. Um, they're never going to be able to get anywhere close to the speed of light because uh, there's not enough power from the sun. But anyway, they do work. A um, couple of grams. But the idea is you can still make this sail that's uh, you know, several square meters, and um, you just make it extremely thin. You can, graphene is a, is a popular material. You know, the Nobel Prize was awarded in graphene, which is just a few, well, graphene is a single atomic layer thick, but this could be maybe five or six atomic layers thick. What can we put on something that's that thin? Well, not people, unfortunately, but electronics is really thin. If you think about the way an integrated circuit is made, uh, it's all on the surface. So you could fill this thing with electronics. You could have tens of thousands of Pentium processors on this thing, doing sensing, measuring magnetic field, taking pictures, and so on. So that part's not that crazy. Um, I did want to tell you sort of where I'm involved in this project. Um, we need to make a 100 gigawatt laser. Okay, how much is 100 gigawatts? Do you know how much 100 gigawatts is? 100 billion, yeah, that's right, yeah. But I mean, that's, okay, I looked it up. The state of Minnesota, you'd have to have 17 states of Minnesota generating their power full out in order to operate this thing. Well, that's not gonna happen. I mean, we might be able to get Wisconsin and, oh, and Iowa to join us, but, but North Dakota is never gonna, <coughs> never gonna join. So where are we going to get all this power? Well, you store it in a huge battery. Okay, lithium-ion batteries just got the Nobel Prize this year. So this technology is all coming along. You store the power for weeks, months, whatever, and then you only need to operate this thing for 200 seconds. So you just blast it out really, really quickly. Um, so I'm working on so the design of this optical system, all a paper study. Um, but um, we're also looking at how you'd point and steer the thing. The aperture of this laser has to be about two kilometers over a mile wide. Okay, that's also crazy. You saw that field of, um, of emitters that were shooting out their beams. 
we have to do things with um, thousands or even millions of lasers. We have to compensate for the atmospheric turbulence, and we have to do it at a reasonable price. I'm not, I'm not involved in this last part, thank goodness. But quite seriously, it does need several orders, of, it needs like a thousand times reduction in the cost that we could make them now in order to make it work. But that's not so crazy. If you think about computers, every few years the computers drop in, in uh, they increase in, in functionality and they, they drop in, um, in price. So it's, it's possible. So my work is in uh, what's called fiber lasers. And I did bring a fiber, kind of a fiber laser. A fiber laser looks just like a telecommunication fiber. It's just like this. Now this actually isn't a fiber laser. The, um, the group in, the, in uh, England, in the University of um, Southampton, makes these fiber lasers for us. It's very much like a telecommunication fiber, except you put in a special atom. It happens to be euterbium. Uh, oops, I guess I say that on the top there. But you just put a euterbium atom in here and then you shine a, um, a semiconductor laser, which is what this is, into this guy. You know, I could use one, this is not a very exciting helper project, but I use one extra hand just to hold this. Could you, could you just hold this for me? And I'd like you to turn the lights out. So if you just hold this and kind of let everybody see. In fact, you can point this at people because um, light's gonna come out of there. So again, if you can turn out all the lights. Um, this is kind of what a fiber laser looks like. Um, but as they say, this isn't actually a fiber laser. Let me get a better. So, oh, I forgot to ask your name. What's your name? Connie. Connie. So Connie's holding the end of this fiber laser and you can see that it's kind of glowing. Uh, and light, in fact, is coming out the end. Imagine doing this but having um, 10 kilowatts come out of this. A typical um, laser pointer is about a milliwatt. That's a, a, a thousandth of a watt. So a fiber laser can actually put out um, 10 million times as much power. Okay, lights on. Thank you, Connie. We'll give you a hand, too. Thank you. Okay, so um, actually most of my work is studying the physics of how fiber lasers work. Because if you want to make very high power ones, you need to uh, understand how they're going to work, especially in, a, um, in an array. And this next picture, which still needs to come up on the screen, shows you um, kind of the idea that we, in order to make this laser have enough power, you'd need to have roughly two million of them. So we'd need a very large area, probably in the desert somewhere. It has to be built in the southern hemisphere, so maybe in, um, maybe in uh, Argentina or something. Can we turn the slide on again? And um, you'd put together this huge array of uh, two million fiber lasers. Fiber lasers are, are cheap and they're not very big, so it, it is possible to do this. Ah, here we go. So here's one that, that our group worked on. It's got three in it. All we need to go is from three to two million. Um, this is, in fact, not the, uh, a laser. This is microwaves, but it's the same idea. You just have this field of all of these things. And, in fact, you can think about making uh, a, uh, a laser that's powerful enough to power this starship. I think I'm going to skip this part on optical communication. Oh, and just go, I'm going to finish off with, if you go to Congress and you ask for a gazillion dollars to do this project, there's a secret that you have to know. And that is, you, first of all, you, you put a lot of work in every individual state. The state of Minnesota has all kinds of things they could do for this project. But the other thing you do is you say, you know, once we build this, we could use it for this and this and this and this. And pretty soon, it just gets so tempting that they give you your money. So here are some of the other things you could do with this laser. And these are, they, at first glance, they might seem ridiculous. Well, some of them are ridiculous. But some of them are not so ridiculous. Removal of space debris, this is actually a big problem. Can you see this picture, all these little dots? It's, it's a little hard to see. This is 
what low Earth orbit looks like around the Earth. Thousands of pieces of space junk. Some of them are alive, but most of them are just dead. Um, but they run into things. And if you had a laser that could push on things, you could actually push the space debris out of the way. You could clear a path, sort of like a, a snow plow in the, in the wintertime. This is actually being seriously considered. Kilowatt class or kilometer class telescopes, because the telescope and the laser are basically the same thing. We could beam power up to the moon. If we want to generate the power here and then beam it up to the moon to use somewhere. Um, asteroid detectors and deflectors, these are actually seriously being considered. This is a NASA prototype uh, of a uh, spacecraft that could actually deflect an asteroid that was coming to hit our Earth and have us go the way of the dinosaurs. We could actually deflect it with something like this. Uh, this, was, this one is being designed to just slam into it, but with the um, with this laser, we could actually do this. And, and a, a bunch of other things. My favorite one is terraforming. That's, that's actually taking a planet and turning it into something that looks like Earth. I have no idea how the laser would operate to do that. But that's, that's, um, that's what you have to tell the congressman to get money, I guess. Okay, so let me just end by saying that, um, first of all, you've been a great audience. I really appreciate um, how engaged you are with things. Um, I wanted to just point out that there are all sorts of other things that um, the optical sciences are doing nowadays. In the lecture after this, the second session, if any of you want to stay, I'm just going to show you briefly what, what I'll be talking about. I have a couple other research projects, uh, one that's seeing around corners with infrared light. I have some infrared cameras I can show you and uh, also some holography and um, some special kind of optics. Um, I'll be demonstrating the greenhouse effect and uh, global warming using these uh, infrared cameras. As I say, we have various holographic displays to look at, and then I'd be happy to discuss anything you want. So anyway, thank you very much for being a great audience. Really uh, had a good time. So we have got six minutes and we're trying to get 12 questions. Donna is on that side. I, I have a microphone here. We do need to tape the questions because it is ultimately broadcasted eventually. So I'm going to go with the first question. I know there's a young scientist waiting to ask a question. It is his turn. Uh, people have already been like, like making little like, s s like nets that will trap space debris and bring them ba back. So could but, you use, could you make a net to trap space debris? No, like people can, but can you use, like bring a laser back to Earth? Ah. To bring space debris back? You mean like was in that video where somehow they turn the laser? Uh, to, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you can, if, if the things aren't too far away, if like they were inside our solar system, you could use a gravity assist. So the laser wouldn't cause the spacecraft to come back, but you could point it towards a very large planet like um, Saturn or Uranus or something and have the gravity assist turn the, the spacecraft around the other way. I think by the time you're out at Alpha Centauri, I, I guess I've heard some people speculate that you might be able to do this, but I, I don't know how you do it with a laser. But maybe you put some thought into that. I mean, that's, uh, that, that would be a, an excellent if we're actually going to go visit these things, it might be nice to be able to come back. Donna? Earlier you mentioned that um, if you, you could put thousands of microprocessors on the sail type thing. And if you did that, wouldn't it lose its aerodynamics because of all the bumps on it? Oh, I missed the last part. Wouldn't it what? If you did that, wouldn't it lose its aerodynamics because of all the bumps on it? Ah, well, that's a great question. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, the chips like in a computer, yeah, they, they, they're a few millimeters high, so you wouldn't be very good aerodynamically. But in fact, the main reason that chips have thickness is just so that we can handle them as humans. Um, the actual electronics that's going on in these chips is just at the surface level, just the few first several hundred atoms maybe. Um, and so in fact, you could make this thing extremely thin 
without any of the bumps that you normally think of as trips. So uh, aerodynamically, it would be, uh, it would be again, very, very thin. Uh, you don't need aerodynamics. I do know what you mean. You don't need aerodynamics because there's no air. But, but there are little particles, even in interstellar space. And if you think about this is going through at 20% uh, of the speed of light, you're going to put lots of holes in your sail. So you have to go um, at uh, basically at a flat angle. And um, it, it'll be extremely flat. How big is the um, how how big is the planet um, near Alpha Centauri compared to one of the planets in our solar system? How big is the planet? Um, I did look this up. I, I, I'm not an astronomer myself, so I had to do a little bit of uh, uh, research on. It. I believe it's uh, Earth size. You're talking about uh, Proxima B. The one that we're talking about going to, I think it's it's Earth size, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it, it might be slightly smaller than Earth size because um, uh, Proxima Centauri is actually much dimmer than our Sun. It's a, it's a red dwarf, so um, the the planet might in fact be closer and smaller. But but I actually don't know. Um, can you make any other vegetables light up? Like, not the pickle, Great like, question. can you make, like, lettuce light up? <laughs> you know, I was told that you guys are going to ask some really great questions, but I, w I wasn't ready for that one. Actually, I am ready for that one. There, there is a paper, a scientific paper that you can look up that tells you how to make vegetable light bulbs, and you, you can make all kinds of different colors and different vegetables. You can make them yellow, you can make them red, you can make them orange, and yeah, there are a variety of different, uh, different vegetables. I don't know about lettuce. I can imagine that might not be the best choice, but uh, there are all sorts of other vegetables that you can. And in fact, I was thinking of doing this, but my wife didn't think it was such a good idea to have put this, these chemicals in our refrigerator. You have to, you have to pickle the thing. You, it, this, this works because it's pickled, which means it's been sitting in brine for a long time. So you have to pickle it not with salt, but with other noxious chemicals. Um, so, but yeah, great question. It can be done. Um, you're talking about how ytterbium is used in the fiber lasers. Um, lutetium being a lanthanide is um, both much more common and almost identical in chemistry to ytterbium. I was just wondering, could you, could you use lutetium in fiber lasers as well? Okay. Okay. You're, now you're talking my language here. I like this. How old are you? 19? 11. Okay, um, right, so it turns out that the, um, it's, it's a rare earth, ytterbium's a, a rare earth, and that whole lanthanide series are, uh, is, you can make lasers in almost every one of them, holmium, erbium, ytterbium, um, um, almost, every, almost every element in that lanthanide series you can make lasers out of. The thing that's so nice about ytterbium is it's extremely, although it's very heavy, and it just has one electron in the outer orbit and it's very, very efficient. But things like holmium happen to laser at two microns, which is a great um, um, wavelength for surgery because it's absorbed by water. So there are a lot of surgical tools that are made with, for example, holmium. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to do one thing. I want you to cooperate. I'm going to take a few more questions. It's 8 o'clock, but there are a lot of young scientists raising their hands. So we're going to take four more questions, but let's not be disrespectful to the speaker. Let's take, let's take the four questions. Donna? Um, with the, how it's turning sideways so it doesn't get hit by space dust, how would it turn sideways if there's no air in space to turn it sideways? With Another it? great question. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was that video had all kinds of crazy things happening and you sort of say, oh, well, how can I do that? How is it going to turn sideways? A um, couple ways. You can put little thrusters on it. They'd be, they'd be optical thrusters because you can make lasers very thin so that they still have the, um, it's still a very um, flat surface, um, which could tip it. The other thing is, in fact, we have a new faculty member in mechanical engineering department that just joined us. And he's working on 
this same project, but he's working on the construction of the nano sail. And uh, if you, depending on how you fabricate the nano sail, you can actually make it so that um, as you shine light on it, you can, you can make the light actually turn it. You'd have to do this in the first 200 seconds because then it's too far away. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question and that's, that's an active area of research of how you do that. Um, if, um, wouldn't it, if it would take 20 years to, to get to Alpha Centauri, so wouldn't it take four years for it to get back, for, to beam the images back? Yeah, well that's, that's, you guys are great. Uh, that's exactly right. It gets there in 20 years, but we don't know until four years later whether it ever happened because it's going to take four point whatever light years just to get the signal back from those pictures to Earth. So we really wouldn't know what's going on for like 25 years or so. That's right. I have a question about the asteroids. Wait, can you just like, just the space junk, you could like just use a sense like a long laser and then like make it shoot down ast as space junk and make it explode? Could you shoot things at the space junk to make it explode? Yeah, with lasers. Yeah, you can. And people have done that and it makes, unfortunately it makes a big mess. So instead of having one piece of space junk, you have thousands of pieces of space junk. Remember, they're going very, very fast. So they're like bullets. And if you, um, if you have thousands of bullets flying around, um, it's not so good. So what's actually the idea here is to change their orbit so that instead of orbiting the way they normally do, they orbit a more elliptical orbit and will come and in, uh, interact with the atmosphere and slowly burn up. That's one thing. You could actually push them into larger orbits so that they get out of the way. But blowing them up, people have done that. And that's, that's uh, it turns out that that's, that unfortunately makes a bigger mess than we started with. Thank you. Uh, would it be possible to make the laser solar powered? Sh shoulder powered? Solar. solar. Solar powered, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I was at uh, MIT Lincoln Labs, we had a, um, a person that was working on exactly that project. Um, and it's, uh, the, the sun on Earth puts out about uh, a kilowatt of energy in a meter. So if you convert that to electricity at like 20% or so, you get about 200 watts. So if you had um, a, something that was about a meter big, maybe you have a, a, a tent or something. You could imagine um, converting maybe that into a 100 watt laser or something like that. So it's very possible to do. Um, we need 100 gigawatts, so that's probably gonna have to come from a whole bunch of nuclear power plants or something. Um, so when you said about like trapping uh, stuff with lasers, did you kind of mean like tractor beams? Like a tractor beam? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you said? It's like a tractor beam? Yeah, absolutely. That's just what it's like. Um, well, it's actually more like a tweezer. In fact, they're called optical tweezers. If you take a beam uh, and you grab onto something, it turns out that the, when you focus the light, it surrounds it with a potential well that, that ends up putting force on all sides. And so it's very much like grabbing it with some tweezers. And you can um, sort cells with this now. You have some bunch of cells flying by and um, with a microscope and you could take each one and grab it and put it somewhere else. You could do surgery on a cell with these things. Um, do just amazing things. Um, but that's all done at the micro level. So this is, this is uh, essentially the same thing, but the macro level. With that question, we're going to close this particular session. But before we do that, let's make sure that we let Dr. Lager know that we truly appreciate his time and effort in telling us how we can reach Alpha Centauri. Well, thank you. It's a lot of fun. For you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
so there are cookies outside but within 5 minutes right here we'll start the round table part 2 right so um can we can we look around the corner like if we looked in that back hallway there um if there were somebody standing out of my line of sight but all i could see is the light that's reflecting from him or her off the wall could i tell that there was somebody there well, this would be amazing if we could do this um so what we are trying to use is infrared light and the, the light that's given off by the human body which is infrared light um, is uh, scatters off of things and you can in fact detect things it's, it's you're not making beautiful pictures, but you might be able to count objects or something like that. So one of the things I thought I'd bring in is a, um, an infrared camera. This is a little infrared camera that goes on a cell phone. And I don't know, can you, can you see me there? Can you see my hand? Okay, you can probably tell that my hands, my, I tend to run kind of cold. So my hands are, um, fingers are probably a lot colder than, than um, the rest of my hand. Um, you can... Let's try this. Um, somebody want to come up here and put their, th who's got warm hands? Need really warm hands. Do you have warm hands? Okay, put your hands right on this computer for a few seconds. Just plaster them on as hard as you can. Your name is Connie, right, okay. So there's Connie's, I, I'm gonna have to do this in a few, few pieces, I think, but. There's Connie's uh, hand. Now remove your hand. Uh, that's the heat that's from her hand there. But actually, let's let's try moving here so other people can see it. Why don't you do it again? So there's there's Connie. Let's show it to other people here. And you can see your hand there. Okay, now kind of move your hand away. Now you can, it, tend, it tends to be very diffuse. So the reason it's diffusing is because that's metal. It'd be much, much better if it were um, like a piece of wood or something. But anyway, um, that's good. Thank you, Connie. Um, let me show you an interesting thing about infrared light. First of all, this, this, um, the wavelength here is maybe um, 20 times the wavelength of visible light. So you, you can't see it. But it has interesting properties. For example, this beaker is uh, made out of glass. And visible light goes through it just fine. You can see things. Um, but infrared light, well, let's try it. Your, your hand is, is giving off this infrared light, so I need somebody else to put their hand in this. Uh, I'll get you back there and, yeah, go in the, in the black shirt. Yeah, you. So what I'm gonna do, you kinda have to tell me, uh, you kinda have to tell me if, if where it's positioned so you can see this. Is that good? Okay, now you can put your, First of all, put your hand right in front of the camera, like right about here. Can you see your name? Can you tell me your name? Sohan. Sohan. Okay, so we're looking at Sohan's hand, right? Now, look what happens. Turn your hand the other way around and place it into the beaker. Yeah. Did you see it disappear? And I pull it out again. And I put it in again. Maybe we can show it over here. Pull it out. Again, am I, am I pointed the right direction? Yeah. And take, take your hand out, put it in, take it out. Okay, so what Sohan just demonstrated, instead of this being glass, let's think of this as carbon dioxide. What just happened? Visible light goes through the carbon dioxide, heats up Sohan's hand. Sohan's acting like a light bulb. He's radiating this energy but it can't get out. That's global warming. That's the greenhouse effect. That's it's called the greenhouse effect because you make greenhouses out of glass. But the same thing happens with carbon dioxide. Now let me do one more thing, Sohan. 
you're going to put your hand in this bag so you can grab the bag. Point it, take it like this maybe. Okay. And I want you to give me, you know, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers, something in the bag, okay? How many fingers is Sohan showing? No clue is the right answer. But look at this. Can you see that? Well, the important thing is you can see through the bag. <laughs> I don't care how many fingers he's showing, but the infrared light is going right through that bag. And so it's because it's just a completely different um, wavelength, it has very unusual properties. Okay, thanks, Sohan. So as I say, some of my work is using cameras like these, but they're, they're um, a little bit more sophisticated, but to try to look at how that light um, given off by people can scatter off of objects and you can actually detect that there's something there without actually having a, a direct line of sight. Um, okay, so the other thing that I brought, and um, it will take me a few minutes to set up, so I don't know if you've got the patience to do that, um, but it won't take me that, that long, um, is a, a, a very large hologram. And I think I would like to show this just because it's really a, um, it's a, it's, it's a really beautiful hologram. And it's also one of the world's first holograms. It was made by the inventor of holography. Actually, there are two inventors of holography. One was Russian, or from the Soviet Union, and one was from the US. This was from the US, Emmett Leith, University of Michigan. Um, and I actually have one of the first holograms. I'm not gonna tell you how I got it, um, but it's kind of a museum piece. So I'm going to set it up on this table, and you can walk by and take a look at it Please don't touch anything because that would be bad it, um, if we broke it. But it's just a, just a gorgeous hologram. And before I show that, maybe I'll say a little bit about how holography works. In order to make a hologram, you have to have a laser. And what you do is you shine a laser at the thing you want to take a picture of. So if it's a person, you shine it at the person. You expand the beam so it completely illuminates the person. The light then reflects off the person and onto, in this case, a special recording medium. It's like film, but, but not quite. You take that same beam and you, you shine it directly on the film. And so these two things beat against each other. They make what's called an interference pattern. The cool thing about this is that um, by making a camera this way, you really have a three-dimensional effect. You've, you've taken uh, and made a three-dimensional camera. And it, um, it's now used in all sorts of biological and uh, physical experiments where you, you want to be able to see something from all different angles and a single view that you get from a standard camera is not good enough. Um, and so this has all been, uh, it's advanced to the point where it's a really good scientific tool you probably know about some holograms that are like on credit cards and that sort of thing. Those are real holograms, but they're very, very um, low quality. But what I'm gonna show you here is very high quality. So let me see if I can do two things at once. Um, I'm going to, if you, if you wanna do this, I'd be happy to maybe field a question while I'm setting this up. You wanna, does anybody have any questions that you want to? Uh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, that's a great question. Yes. Um, so the question is, is it possible to project a hologram? So I don't know. My, my generation really liked um, Star Wars. I don't know if you guys see. Have you, do, you, do you watch Star Wars? Is that? OK. All right, so remember Princess Leia that came out of R2-D2? That's really hard to do um, because remember that um, laser beam that I was showing you? The only way you could see that beam is because it was reflecting off of uh, dust. And so same with a hologram. Uh, in order to do a, a Princess Leia type thing, um, 
you need to have a um, some sort of a scattering medium. So it can be done, but um, it, it's very difficult. On the other hand, this hologram, which I'm just setting up right now, does have what's called a, um, a real image mode where the image does appear to form on this side of the screen. Unfortunately, the way I'm setting it up right now, we're not going to be able to see it very well. But um, um, you can, in fact, make the image appear in front. But what you have to do is look directly into uh, the light source. You, you can't just see it from all around a room, which is like the Princess Leia thing. That's, that turns out to be much more difficult. But it can be done. How about one more question and then I'll... Absolutely. And if you have any good ideas on how we're going to fix that, um, I'd love to hear it because that's one of the projects I'm working on. Yeah, so um, when light goes through the atmosphere, uh, like in astronomy, that's what makes the stars twinkle. It's, it messes up their wave fronts. Same thing happens the other way around. If you're sending light from the Earth out, in fact, it's worse, it turns out. Um, so what we have to do is we have to compensate for that atmosphere. And what we actually do is measure exactly what it's doing by putting a beacon outside the atmosphere, letting the beacon come through, taking a look at what happened to the light, taking a mirror and warping it in a way that's exactly backwards. So it starts out backwards such that when it goes through the atmosphere, it gets put back together again. That's called adaptive optics. And that's what you have to do for this. Or you could build a laser on the moon or in space, but that's just way too expensive. It's gonna have to be built on Earth. So you have to, you have to use adaptive optics, which is just measuring the distortion and pre-distorting it so that when it goes through the atmosphere, it gets unknown. Um, there's not enough solar energy to uh, power such a big laser. You can make a laser using solar energy, it's just not enough. And you can use the solar light itself, um, but it's just not enough. So that's, I mean, people have done these calculations. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we ought to just, just move this whole thing. Um, so what I'm gonna do this is going to take a little while, actually, and it might be a disaster because there's so many people here. But I'm going to set this up, and you're going to have to walk by this to take a look at it. So maybe you want to start queuing up, um, and that's going to take a little while. But um, you're going to have to look at it fairly quickly because because um, otherwise it's going to take too long. And let me just explain what I have here. I have a, um, a laser. This is a helium neon laser. Nothing particularly special about it. I'm plugging it in. And now, oh, thank you. You know, it's, it's going to be more fun if we could turn the lights out. Maybe, can you turn them out so that it's, um, or maybe just turn them down. We don't want it to be completely dark because people are going to be walking around. Um, okay, so the only thing I ask is to not touch any of this stuff. And so right now I'm going to turn the laser beam on. This laser, by the way, is not powerful enough that it'll hurt you. So if you do get zapped by it, even if it goes into your eye, like it's on your shoulder right now, um, you, you don't need to worry about it. It's a, it's a, it's a safe power level. Okay, so now I'm going to, actually, can you make the light a little bit darker? The, um, yeah, 
And I'm going to adjust this and show you where to look. Okay, so it's, if you stand right here, you're just going to walk by it. What I want you to do is to move your head around. Move your head around and you can really see, it looks like it's like, you know, maybe half a meter behind the screen. And it, it has complete parallax. As you move your head, you can, um, oh yeah, don't touch anything, please. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it, it has, it, it looks like it's really three-dimensional. And you can, as you move your head back and forth, you can see, you can look around a corner, you can uh, see one thing going past another. So let's, let's, let's all kind of file by from uh, right to left, if we can do that. You need, you need to, so that the best viewing is right about here. So you guys are going to get the best viewing. And after you view, if you can just kind of keep walking by. Now you can actually see it really well right back here, so. So it's been, um, it's been said, <coughs> because it's true, that if you take a hologram and you break it into two pieces, you get two complete images. I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna break this. If you could break this into a hundred pieces and you get a hundred complete pictures here, which is really weird. That's not the way pictures usually work. You know, break a picture in half and you get the left half on one side and the right half on the other side. Here, if you break this into just a piece that's a, a square centimeter and you run a laser beam through that, you'd get the entire picture. It's very, very strange. I can actually demonstrate that after everybody's had a chance to look at this, perhaps. Yeah, don't look directly into it. It's not going to hurt you, but that's not what, what you want to do. You want to be maybe over here. Yeah. There you go. So it turns out you can use holograms to... Um, measure very, very small motions and things. Mechanical engineers that build complicated structures and they wanna see what's gonna happen if they heat them up and they might just change the very smallest amount, uh, can take a, a hologram of that structure and then heat it a little bit and they can see where the thing is expanding and where it's contracting. They can modify their designs using that. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how holography could be used to, uh, to make better lasers. That was what a lot of my research used to be on. So we actually put a, a hologram inside the laser cavity to try to make the laser uh, performance improve. So I don't know if any of your parents in the room um, Remember Scientific American, that's still still being published, but in the, uh, in the 1960s when holography was invented, uh, this picture was on the cover of Scientific American because as I said, this was one of the first holograms ever made. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not telling. <laughs> Yeah, there's a main beam that comes here that's pretty bright, but you want to get past that, sort of in this area. You can see it pretty well. You want to put your head more over here, I think. There you go.
Ja. Um, you don't have to use a diffuser for this because the, um, the, the reference beam, if you're familiar with this, is just a plane wave. So there's no diffuser. You can use a diffuser, but you didn't have to here. Um, and the objects act like their own diffuser because they're rough. Because they're made out of like plaster of Paris or something, they end up acting like diffusers. So there's really nothing to do. You, you, you originally had that object right back here. Yep. You shine laser light off it and it reflects onto this thing. And you take another beam like this and just shine it directly on there and you're done. That's all you need to do. So I don't know uh, how many of you know that um, the physics department got a brand new building four or five years ago called the uh, Physics and Nanotechnology Building. Very expensive, full of lots of equipment. Um, and Mark Dayton was the, was the uh, governor at the time, and the physics department wanted to give him a present. And they thought it would be really cool to give him a present, which is a hologram of the building that he helped pay for. Um, so the physics department said, um, well, that would be great. Who, who knows how to make a hologram? Of course, I wasn't at this meeting, and that's why um, I was given the task to uh, make the hologram because I wasn't there to object. And so we in fact made a hologram of the physics building. Um, Mark Dayton didn't show up at the commencement uh, and so somebody else got that hologram. But in fact, that, um, that was one of, the, uh, one of the last times I've made a hologram. Because as I said, my research really isn't in holography anymore. But years ago it was. Absolutely. Can you make what? Visual light as opposed to visual light? Visible, Visible light. Two visions, you get a lot of different shapes and things like that. So you can make two different types of light. Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh. okay, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, I might change it a little bit, but if you have two beams of light and you let them cross, does anything interesting happen when they cross? And in fact, is it possible to have them generate some other form of light or something? If it's in a vacuum, the answer is no. Um, the beams just go through each other. They're called bosons and bosons don't interact with each other. But if there's a crystal there, the answer is not only yes, but there's all kinds of great science that one can do. And in fact, you can take two infrared beams, which can't be seen, and when they cross, you get the sum of the frequencies, which then can be in the visible. So you can take, um, and as a matter of fact, this laser pointer starts out making infrared light. It's a, um, Somebody knew about this, a, a YAG laser, yttrium aluminum garnet. I know somebody was talking about that. So it's, it's neodymium doped uh, yttrium aluminum garnet is what's in this thing. Um, pumped by a semiconductor laser, it gives out infrared light. But then it does exactly what you suggested. Uh, almost exactly. Instead of taking two beams, it's a little bit different. But it's converting that into visible by the interaction that you're describing. It's that, that area is called nonlinear optics, and it's a huge area of optics. Is it possible to create a holographic touch screen? A hologram of a touch, is it possible to make a hologram of a touch screen? Um, yes, yes, but the only way we know how to make holograms is by illuminating them with a laser. So you won't see the light from the touch screen. You'll see the box that the touch screen's in where the laser light is bouncing off it. But the light that's actually coming from the touch screen won't make a hologram. And actually that's a really interesting and useful property. You can make a hologram of a incandescent light bulb. And in fact, the light that's given off by the incandescent light bulb doesn't do anything. 
So you can look inside the light bulb and see the little filament. And in fact, you can see the um, convection currents of the gas inside there because the, the laser light is seeing that. But this huge amount of light that's given off by the light bulb doesn't make a hologram. So it's actually an advantage. But in your touchscreen example, you wouldn't see all the, um, the information on the screen. Um, so like, how did you make it so that you could look around and see like the 3D shapes without it totally falling apart? Without it what? Without it like totally just looking like it's falling apart. Falling apart? Yeah, how do you make it so that you can see like the 3D shapes and when you move your head, yeah. you can see them like. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm going to, um, do a little philosophy with you. So you'll tell me if you like this, you, you may not. But I'm looking at you right now. Am I looking at you? No, I'm looking at the light that's bouncing off of you, right? And if I move over here, different lights bouncing off you, and you look three-dimensional. I can, I can walk all around and see you. Well, what if I had, and, and that light is coming from you into my eye. What if I had a, a magic screen which took ordinary light and converted it into the same wave front, the same, the same shape. I can't tell whether it's coming from you or whether it's coming from this magic screen. But it has the same property. If I move over here, I see a different amount of light. That's what the hologram does. It's this magic screen which takes ordinary laser light and converts it into the same shape that I would see if I look directly at you. So these objects that we looked at existed in 1964 when this hologram was made um, and that information has been captured by this piece of glass forever. You can also make holograms uh, in cylinders so you can completely walk around the thing. So you get not only this limited view, field of view but you can get complete field of view. Yeah, well interestingly the information on here, maybe do we have enough time I can show one more demo or um, how are we I doing? Well, it will take a few more minutes, okay? This, I think this will okay. be really quick. Okay, go ahead. Remember I said that you can um, break this thing into a thousand pieces and you get a thousand holograms? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to do the next best thing. I'm going to take this laser beam, you see this is, again, if I hit, hit somebody in the face, do, do not worry, this will not kill you. Um, but I'm going to take this laser beam and I'm going to shine it directly into this hologram and just illuminate the tiniest little piece. That's essentially like breaking it into a bunch of pieces, right? And let's see what we see. So I think I'm going to need a couple of people to just, it's kind of a boring job, but you want to help in the, in the red? Yes. We need one other person. Who haven't I picked? Have I picked you yet? You? Okay. So you're going to be this screen here. So you just hold this and you're going to hold the other end. And hopefully you'll be able to see something here. I'm going to shine this. Um, well, who am I going to zap? Um, Okay, so I can put the screen up a little bit so that it hits about there. Okay, now if you turn out the light, why don't you move a little bit closer. Maybe a little bit closer. And we're going to have to have the lights out for this, I think. Hmm, I think we need to be a lot closer. How about it? Oh, it's over here. Here it is. Okay, so can everybody see that? I think maybe if you want to stand a little bit more to the side. There you go. Can you can you see this? There, there you go. Can you see that? Okay, so I'm just illuminating this tiniest bit. 
so what is the difference between where I illuminate things? Look what happens. Just looking at things from different perspectives. Do you see how when I'm moving this up and down, you can see the thing, the arch, the ABC. Can you see the ABC and the arch now? Okay, and I move it down. It, I'm looking over the top of the arch now. So what you're seeing is a complete reconstruction, but from a particular vantage point. And that's where the three dimensions coming from. Your eye is picking up different vantage points and it looks three dimensional. Now maybe we can get this uh, one over here as well. <coughs> okay, that's it. Thank you guys, you can put that down. Okay, Donna, you have a question? Oh, thank you. Um, do holographs help 3D with 3D printing? In, in oh, do can you use holograms with 3D printing? What's wow. the question, Jim? Yes, can you use holograms with 3D printing? Um, a great idea. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody who's doing that, but you certainly should be able to. But I can give you one story. How much time do we have, by the way? Should I be not? Minus, minus 10 minutes. <laughs> one story. Remember I told you that we were making a, um, a, a hologram of the physics building for uh, the governor? Well, you, it's really difficult to make the hologram of the whole building. So we used a 3D printer to make a 3D replica of the building, and we made a hologram of that 3D printed object. So that's one thing you can do. But I bet you were thinking of something more exciting, and um, uh, and I'm sure there are really cool things one could do. Okay, we'll take the last question okay. from this young lady here. Oh, well, two questions. Let's see. She has a priority over you. Okay. <laughs> um, could you make a laser gun? Can you make a laser gun? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this giant laser that we're talking about, um, you have to be really careful with it because obviously it can propel spacecraft, but it can also do damage to things. So that act, that kind of does act like a gun, you know. So you have to be very careful with it. Okay, not this question here. Uh, me. Hmm. About the laser beam, uh, project propelling a satellite. Where would the laser field need to be in a rotating Earth? Or I a missed that last part, where would? Since our Earth is rotating on its axis, where would the laser beam field need to be uh -huh. on Earth to, for it to steadily project right. to propel the? That's a great question. And that's one that I've thought a lot about because I'm part of my project is how you steer this thing. So the laser has to be in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, best if it's in the southern hemisphere. It certainly couldn't be as far north as Minnesota because we can't see Alpha Centauri. So as far as the world goes, it would have to be in the southern hemisphere. Um, it has to take into account the fact that the Earth is turning. Um, it's only on for 200 seconds, but that's plenty of time to have, it, it, the motion is about a half a degree. So it actually has to track a half a degree. So this, the, the beam has to steer uh, very accurately so that it's always on target for about a half a degree. Um, and it turns out that can be done. It's, it's difficult, but uh, it can be done. So Southern Hemisphere and you have to steer it. Uh, so it basically has to unwind the, the rotation of the Earth, yeah. So with this, we have formally closed the program. But first of all, I want to thank those guys up there who are helping us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Perfect job. And then, and then I want to thank our speaker tonight, Dr. Lager, for spending extra time with us in educating us. Thank you, Dr. Lager. Well, you guys are great. I'm, I, I, it's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure.